Thank you, Mbumi. Do me lang, Luya Mochetwe Momochai, Siana Magala Rooted Fellowship. Welcome, Bayons Kak. Welcome to church. Uh, if we haven't had the privilege of meeting yet, my name is Jono, and I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here under our lead pastor, Pastor Oni Mokhatle. Uh, and I greet you all in the wonderful name of our living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, uh, we are in a sermon series entitled The Psalms, a mixtape. And if we rewind a little bit to last week, uh, y'all will recall that we got the privilege of hearing an amazing sermon by Elder Mungani. Uh, and he took us through David's Psalm of Confession, Psalm 51, David's Psalm of Confession. And so if we fast forward just a little bit uh, till today, we'll hear that I have the privilege of uh, navigating us through the next track, track 13 on side B of Psalm's mixtape, Psalm 98. We're going to get into Psalm 98. But before I push play on this uh, amazing track, Let's hit pause, and we're going to chat through a little bit of the context of this track, okay? The discography, if you will, uh, of this track. Remember, Psalm 98 uh, comes from Book 4. comes from Book 4 within the Biblical Wisdom Book of Psalms. Uh, remember, there are five books within the Biblical Wisdom Books of the 150 Psalms. And as we've been listening to this mixtape, uh, we we've heard that the Book of Psalms is essentially a collection of 150 ancient Hebrew poems, songs and prayers from the various periods of the nation of Israel's history. After the nation of Israel's exile to Babylon, these 150 Psalms were carefully arranged, they were put together, and they were intentionally ordered into the book of Psalms that we have before us today. Now, the book of Psalms, uh, namely book four, um, being Psalms 90 to 106, uh, serve primarily as an encouraging response by God's people to being in exile. I'm going to say that again, okay? So book four, Psalms 90 to 106, serve primarily as an encouraging response by God's people to being in exile. And at the center of book four, we find Psalms 93 to 99, of which, of course, our track for today, Psalm 98, forms part of. Now, these seven Psalms encouragingly proclaim that Yahweh the Lord God of Israel reigns as the one true king over all nations and over all creation, over the trees, over the rivers, over the seas, the mountains. They are all creatures, all people, all things are being called to look to and to celebrate the future day when God will bring his justice and kingly reign over all the earth. What an encouragement, amen? Now remember fam, most of the psalms, most of the 150 psalms were used by the choirs uh, that sang in Israel's temple or they were prayed by families at home. But as we've already heard in the book of Psalms series, uh, the book of Psalms is not merely a book or a prayer book or a, uh, a song book. In essence, the book of Psalms is a virtual temple that God's people enter into in order to meet with God to hear and savor and enjoy and delight in the story of God's kingdom sung back to us as poetry. The book of Psalms is a virtual temple that we get to enter into in order to meet with God, in order to delight in the story of God's kingdom sung back to us as poetry. Theologians say that Psalm 98 in particular is a song of joy and victory. God is victorious over everything, amen? And so because of this, all of his followers get to partake in his victory over enemies, sin and death. And we get to enjoy this victory. Firstly, as we look back to what God has done in the past, but we also get to enjoy this victory as we delight in how God reigns in the present. And we get to enjoy this victory as we think upon and look to how he will come again to reign in the future. And as a result of this, we can find joy in him. Amen? Right? Right? Can we be real for a minute? We touched a bit on this uh, this past week at Family Group. If you've been a Christian for a while, let's be honest, things can grow cold. We know that we are a victorious people. We know that we have joy and victory in Christ, but... Man, sometimes we know it here, but we don't know it here. 
things can grow cold on our end. God is constant. He remains the same. But we, just like we saw with David last week, we in our sin, we can make some really foolish choices, which really affects the relationship that we have with our Creator God. We take our eyes off of who God is, off of whose we are, and we become obsessed, overcome by the things of this world. Add to that the fact that we actually also have an enemy, a defeated one, but nevertheless, we still have an enemy, one who hates the people of God. And if he can no longer have a claim to our eternal lives, well, then he's going to wage war against our present joy. If Satan doesn't have a claim to your eternal life anymore, he will wage war against your present joy. And he seeks to cause us to worship other things. Is God really good? Does he really have good in store for you? And so often we as the people of God, we look no different from the world surrounding us. We don't look like a people in exile in this broken world. We look fully at home. Instead of being distinct, set apart people living joyfully and hopefully in exile, we have very much made a comfortable home for ourselves here in the sinful broken world. And in doing that, we miss out on delighting in the fact that Jesus has come and rescued us by coming to earth, being born a sinless virgin birth, living the perfect sinless life, dying the perfect all-sufficient death, defeating sin and death in being raised from the dead, and in the fact that all who put their faith and trust in him have abundant and eternal life secured. We have the privilege of delighting in that every single moment. Rooted Fellowship family, in Jesus Christ we have victory and joy. But are we living that out? Really, are we living that out? And I don't mean that in a type of health, wealth, and prosperity way. I don't mean that if we just, in our own strength, seek to alter our attitude to a perpetual, rosy, positive one, and then follow a set of regulations that life will be plain sailing. I don't mean that. But in Jesus, we do indeed have victory, favor, and joy. But are we living out that hope? Even as I prepared for the message this week, I'll be honest, it's been a struggle. It's been a struggle to believe that I am victorious and that I can have joy no matter what. The year's going by so quickly, we're in August. It's causing me to feel overwhelmed. I, I have not got to the things I'd hoped I got to, I'd have gotten to by now. I'm not getting to the things I'd hoped I've got to. Things aren't going according to my plan. I used to be very early at gatherings. Now that I have a little toddler, I'm starting to be at peace with the fact that on time is 20 minutes late. I, things aren't going according to my plan. Also, whilst recognizing the incredible privileges that I have access to, I have to honestly admit that water shortages, power outages, drastic changes to schedules, feeling like there is never enough time, experiencing the brokenness of this world, either directly happening to me or indirectly happening to those whom I love, this causes me to feel down, deflated and defeated, not joyful and victorious. But I was challenged. Pastor Oney said this a couple of sermons back. He said, if all we had was salvation, would that be enough for us? If all that we had was salvation in Jesus Christ, would that be enough? But God, amen? Oh, but God, in his infinite love and wisdom, knows that his people need encouragement and reminders. And so he gives us countless. In fact, we saw a couple of these things last week that he gives us. He gives us prayer. We saw last week that David prayed Psalm 40, 51, verse 12. Remember, he said this. He says, Lord, restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Restore the joy of your salvation to me. Sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. And today, that's, that's one of my, my prayers for us. Lord, would you restore the joy of your salvation to us? Secondly, we saw last week in Psalm 51, verses 13 to 19, 
they, 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 they tell us that God's people are continually invited back to the corporate gathering of worship. Because through corporate worship gatherings, we are reminded of victory and joy that we have in God. Amen? Many of us have already experienced that this morning. Before I've even got up here, because of question of the day, the fellowship, the worship, man, we're feeling victorious and joyful just by being here. And so another prayer of mine this morning is that we leave this place, each and every single one of us, brothers and sisters, would we leave here joyful and victorious as the fruit of the life that we have found in Christ. Amen? And then thirdly, God gives us his word in his mercy and grace. Man, an explicit reminder of the joy and victory that we have in him. And we're really going to see this in our text this morning. Now, I've quoted this twice over the course of this series, and surprise, surprise, I'm going to do it again. Tim Keller said that the Psalms were not written merely to be read, but they are to be prayed, recited, and sung, to be practiced, and to be done. And so much like we did with track four, Psalm 16, track eight, Psalm 27, this morning I'm going to once again invite you to stand with me and recite with me together Psalm 98 from the beautiful Word of God. So I invite you to stand. We're going to read from the screen in front of us from Psalm 98, and we're going to be reading together uh, from the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB. And we're going to read it aloud. We're going to go slowly. And as we do this, I invite you to truly pray these words. And so with that, uh, come Holy Spirit, lead us. Move within our hearts and our minds as we say these words. Lord, indeed your words together. Psalm 98, praise the King, a psalm. Verse 1, let's say together. Sing a new song to the Lord, for he has performed wonders. His right hand and holy arm have won him victory. The Lord has made his victory known. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen our God's victory. Let the whole earth shout to the Lord. Be jubilant, shout for joy and sing. Sing to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and melodious song. With trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn, shout triumphantly in the presence of the Lord, our King. Let the sea and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it, resound. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains shout together for joy before the Lord. For he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world righteously and the peoples fairly. Let's pray. A gracious, loving Father God, we praise you as the God who is life, who brings life and who makes us alive. We praise you, Lord God, for your faithfulness. Thank you for all that you have done, O oh God. God, you are mighty, you are a creator, you are victorious, you are set apart holy and wonderful. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you are so loving and mindful of us. We thank you for the victory and joy that we have in you, Jesus Christ. God, we pray now that your Holy Spirit would come and lead us in everything that we do as we journey through your word together. Lord, would you give us understanding? Would you move us to live out our faith in hope, joy, and victory? I pray, Lord, that you would guide me now as I seek to preach your word faithfully. Would you open our ears to hear, our eyes to see, and our hearts to receive all that you would have us see, hear, and know this morning, Lord. Oh God, would you lead us to worship you out of an overflow of our grateful response to who you are and all that you've done. It's in Jesus' precious, wonderful, and glorious name that we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. I invite you to take a seat. Okay, now, as we read the psalm, you may have caught this already, uh, but Psalm 98 is a psalm of praise, okay? It's a psalm of praise. It's, it's a psalm that reflects on the past, present, and future reasons for God's universal praise. And it invites us to join our voices, our instruments, 
to join in with all of creation as we praise God together for his acts of salvation. Let's go through verses 1 to 3. In verses 1 to 3, the psalmist praises God for past acts of faithfulness. When he says, verse 1, Sing a new song to the Lord, for he has performed wonders. His right hand and holy arm have won him victory. The Lord has made his victory known. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen our God's victory. This psalm of victorious joy begins with the same phrase as Psalm 96, two psalms back. Sing to the Lord a new song. And here this phrase seeks to celebrate God's merciful restoration. Scholars agree that in these first three verses of Psalm 98, verses 1 to 3, the psalmist is praising God for past acts of God's deliverance, namely Israel's exodus from Egypt. And more specifically, when God made a pathway through the sea for the nation of Israel to cross through. Verse 1, the psalmist mentions God's right hand and his holy arm. He's in fact quoting from Exodus 15 verse 6 and Isaiah 51 verse 10 respectively. In Exodus 15, 6, Moses and the nation of Israel sing a song. They say, Lord, your right hand is glorious in power. Lord, your right hand shattered the enemy, being the Egyptians, as the Lord has closed the, the sea over them, over the, over the chasing Egyptian army. And then in Isaiah 51, verse 10, the prophet Isaiah poetically writes, he says, Wasn't it you, God, who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the seabed into a road, for the redeemed to pass over. You see, fam, the psalmist knows that a, that a walk of faith builds its hope for the future on God's proven faithfulness in the past. He knows that when we encounter challenges to our faith, we need to recall the faithfulness of God. And so he urges God's people to look to and to meditate on God's faithfulness of the past as an inspiration for our current and future situations. This past uh, Friday, I got to celebrate 11 years of marriage to my beautiful bride, Kirsty. <laughs> Praise God. And uh, one of the joyful things that we got to do this, this, this past week is, is reflect on God's goodness and faithfulness over the past 11 years. And that serves as an encouragement to go forward again. The psalmist urges God's people to look to and to meditate on God's faithfulness of the past as an inspiration for our current and future situations. And he does so, get this, by calling us to get creative and to sing a new song to the Lord that both praises him for his victories in our lives and in the lives of his people. He calls God's people to declare in song God's faithfulness and salvation. You see, fam, the, the, the psalmist is aware that there is something incredible that happens when the people of God dwell on the faithful works of God in song and then use those songs as inspirations for future songs. Check this out. He dwells on the songs of the nation of Israel from Exodus and Isaiah. He then pens a song to the glory of God in authoring Psalm 98 and in the song, he then calls fellow and future believers to sing new songs in an eternal, everlasting, joyful, victorious hymn of celebration and praise. I heard one commentator this week uh, speaking through this psalm. Uh, he made mention of um, the, the elders and the creatures and the angels singing uh, in Revelation. Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. And the commentator says that we, we, we read the words holy, holy, holy. And yes, God is infinitely holy and set apart. But the, but the created creatures and the angels, they're not singing holy, holy, holy three times repetitively. They're singing to one another. They're reminding one another of the holiness of God. Now, I'd like you to take notice that the psalmist in our text for today doesn't say to all those who are gifted at singing and stringed instruments, to joy, Ruth, Stephen and Tiro, sing a new song. He doesn't say that. No, nope, he, says, he says to all. 
You see, singing is a dynamic and vital part of our devotional life, fam. The Psalms refer to singing more than 70 times because God designed praise to be a pathway to joy. And so even if you do not feel like you sing well, know that your heavenly Father loves the sound of your voice. It isn't important how well you sing, but simply that you sing. There's something beautiful about the corporate singing. Man, I think Pastor Honor said this uh, a few weeks ago. Man, the band can sound great, but there's nothing like the people of God in unison singing together. And think about it, uh, those things at sporting events or concerts when we get to participate in corporate singing. We lose all self-consciousness. We forget that we don't sing well and we get to partake in what, what the group is doing. Now you say though, Jono, yeah, sure. Maybe it's easy for you to say because you can sing. Sure. But he, please hear me. If you aren't very musical, you're not exempt from praising God. Because at its essence, the psalm is an actual fact encouraging all of us to express our praise to God in creative and original ways. The psalm is inspiring us to explore and embrace creativity in our worship of our God. Not merely on Sundays, not just on Sundays, not just at family group or at church. Brother and sister, how can you show your gratitude to God by praising him through a fresh soundtrack to your life? How has God uniquely wired you to praise and worship him? Are you gifted musically? Great. Let's hear those songs. Do you sing new songs to him about his faithful acts of which there are countless? Are you gifted with words? Do you write about the faithfulness of God in your journals? Are you gifted with your hands? Do you let the creation story or the fact that Jesus was a carpenter inspire you to create, to draw, to paint? Do you cook or bake to the glory of God? Taste and see that the Lord is good, amen? Are you gifted with finances and kind acts that enable you to praise God by blessing others? How can you look to the songs of the past, God's faithfulness, and allow the Holy Spirit to move in you to praise and worship God with your gifts, to join in the everlasting, unending, joyful, victorious song of celebration and praise? Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. We come to the next stanza in the text for today, verses four to six. Verses four to six, the psalmist joyfully celebrates how God presently reigns when he describes what the praise of a reigning victorious king on a throne looks like. Verse four, it says, let the whole earth, the whole earth shout to the Lord. Be jubilant, shout for joy and sing. Sing to the Lord with the lyre. Lyre was like a harp or a U-shaped string, U-shaped stringed instrument. Okay, so think kind of guitar. Sing to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and melodious song. With trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn, shout triumphantly in the presence of the Lord, our King, our King. Now in these verses, the psalmist is actually making mention of Numbers 10.10, which specified the law which God gave to Moses, describing how to practice victorious or celebratory occasions. Numbers 10.10 says, says this, you are to sound the trumpets over your burnt offerings and your fellowship sacrifices, and on your joyous occasions, your appointed festivals, and the beginning of each of your months. They will serve as a reminder for you before your God, I am the Lord your God. So originally, verses one to three, the psalmist praises God for the freedom he brought to the nation of Israel through the Exodus. But then here in verses four to seven, he writes about and prophesies about the praise of a reigning ever victorious king to all nations. Now, because we are alive now, we have the privilege of knowing that in dying on the cross, Jesus accomplished the greatest liberation of all nations. And so this liberation far exceeds Israel's exodus from Egypt. Jesus Christ is the ultimate priest, prophet, and king. Jesus' death on the cross also explains how the previous psalm, Psalm 97, with its depiction of 
of God's holiness and wrath can then be followed up by the exuberant praise and utter joy of our Psalm 98. Because Jesus Christ has paid for our sins in full. And in him, God sees us as beautifully perfect and righteous. We are declared beautifully perfect and righteous. And did you see it, fam? In verses 4 to 7, the psalmist expands his invitation by not just mentioning the nation of Israel, but here, in fact, he calls for all the inhabitants of the earth. Let the whole earth celebrate the current reign of the conquering king. By doing what? By preparing themselves for the return of this king. By in the meantime, while we wait for his return, by beginning to welcome him, by shouting for joy, by bursting into jubilant song and making beautiful music. All of this praise is in response to the Jesus saving work that has truly, truly saved all of those who rejoice in him, who put their faith and trust in him before his coming return. Family of God, are we calling all nations to join in this hymn of praise? We may not be called to write missional songs. We may not be blessed with the ability to play musical instruments to the glory of our God. But are the soundtracks of our lives putting on display the current reign of our King Jesus Christ? Are they serving as salt and light to a world, all nations, in desperate need of a Savior? Uh, the song that I... I remembered a while back from 2005, written by Casting Crowns. Mark Hall wrote this. It's a, it's a verse from the, the, the song, Life Song. It says, Lord, I give my life a living sacrifice to reach a world in need, to be your hands and feet. So may the words I say and the things I do make my life song sing and bring a smile to you. In the first three verses, the psalmist speaks of Israel's freedom before all nations. But then here in verses 4 to 7, he calls all nations to praise God in preparation for their coming king. You see, family, by remembering what our King Jesus did and who we are in light of this, and by keeping this front of mind, by meditating on this, by writing songs about this, by celebrating this, by living from this standpoint, we're able to remain joyful in our relationship with God and in the living out of our faith. Because of our King Jesus' liberating work on the cross, we are declared righteous before a holy God. And because of this, we can remain jubilant and joyful no matter what we face. And thus we praise him with all of our hearts, with all of our minds, with all of our souls, with all of our strength. And we can even use tools, technology, and instruments to amplify our exuberant praise of his glory as well. Amen? We then come to the third, final stanza, verses 7 to 9 of Psalm 98, where the psalmist joyfully looks to and expectantly anticipates God's future coming. Verse 7 to 9 says, Let the sea and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it, resound. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains shout together for joy before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world righteously and the people's fairly. How beautiful these verses. Nature echoes and reverberates the true joy of God's people as we anticipate the return of the great king. But the imagery here of the sea, rivers, and mountains praising God is more than just mere poetry, family. The rejoicing of the animal and plant life in the sea and on the earth, it constitutes the fulfillment of all created life. In Romans 8, 18 to 25, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is going to be revealed to us. 
for the creation eagerly awaits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves, who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in this hope we were saved. But hope that is, not, that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? Verse 25, now if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. Theologians say that we can see from these verses that even nature itself was made to be far more alive and glorious than it is in its current state now. But verse 9 from our psalm today shows that it is only the God King, Jesus, who is coming to restore all of creation to its rightful place. And so family, our future hope is powerfully joyful because if the seas, the rivers, and the mountains will be even more magnificent, upon Jesus' return, then what can be said of those made in God's image? 1 John 3, 2 says this. He says, Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what will we be, and what will be has not been yet revealed. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him as he is. Family, Jesus fulfilled the joy and victorious anticipation of God's people when he first came to earth to save all people from their sin. And family, he will fulfill the joyful and victorious anticipation of God's people again when he returns to judge and restore all things. Rooted Fellowship, we, we have the privilege of praising the name of Jesus. Firstly, for his promise to save all of those who put their faith and trust in him. And secondly, for his promise to return again. And so what is our response to the track this morning? What is our response to Psalm 98? Well, are we going to like, subscribe, and even download it to our heart's devices? Or are we going to enjoy it for a few minutes whilst we're here? and then scroll on, browse for something a little bit more appealing and satisfying in the next moment. Or perhaps our response will be to mark this track and this Jesus biblical channel as offensive. I'm not interested in this. Brothers and sisters, friends and family, God's unending, joyful, victorious praise may not be your soundtrack at this moment. But there will come a time when this soundtrack will be on play for eternity. And this should either bring us such comfort and joy that we are a people who can't help but exude joy to the world. Or this should serve as a stark reminder that Jesus is coming back soon. And whilst we still can, I pray that we choose to submit to him as Lord and Savior not out of fear or guilt, but out of love and thanksgiving for his faithful saving works, past, present, and future. Root of Fellowship, nothing in this world will truly bring joy and satisfaction other than a life centered and saturated by the perfect birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so if that joy if that victory and if that satisfaction is something that you have found for yourself, or you have found yourself searching for in the things of this world, and yet you're still missing out on true joy, then man, I pray that the Holy Spirit would lead you to put your faith and trust in Jesus joyfully this morning, right now, into his everlasting victory over sin and death and suffering. Family, our message for today doesn't seek to minimize the struggles that some of us face. Some of y'all are going through the most. We're not, we're not being called to be falsely optimistic. This is a broken world. But our, for message, our message for today does seek to view our current struggles within their rightful place and context. 
Jesus' followers have an eternal and abundant life secured. We have an eternal and an abundant life secured. God has been faithful in saving us. He reigns no matter what the world or our present short-term suffering seek to tell us. And he is coming back to make all things new and to wipe away every single tear. And so in light of that, we can be joyful. We can live from a place of victory. And we can be a hope to the world. I'm going to call the band up. Please, band, would you come up? As uh, We respond in prayer. I'm going to invite you to stand as we pray together. Oh, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that your word, these psalms, were written to serve as an encouragement to those in exile. Lord God, thank you that through the Psalms we can enter into a virtual temple and read your word and that these Psalms, Lord God, could be an encouragement to us as a people in exile. Lord God, we are, we are in this world, Lord God, but we are not of this world. You have saved us from this broken world, Lord God. And as we think upon your faithful acts, Lord God, the fact that you have saved and brought us to this point, Lord God, we give you thanks, honor, and praise. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you died on a cross and paid for our sins, that you satisfied God's wrath and his, and his mercy, Lord God, and his justice, that you brought about his mercy, Lord God, to us. We confess, Lord God, that so many times we, we've forgotten that, We've grown cold to the fact that you have saved us from an internal separation from our Creator, Father God. But we thank you, Lord God, that you constantly call us back. You call us back to the gathering. You call us back to you. We thank you for your word, Lord God, that encourages us. We thank you for the fact that we can come before you in prayer right now. That we can meet together as your people. Lord God, I pray, Holy Spirit, would you come now? Would you move in our hearts? Would you cause us to exude your joy, Lord God? With the truth of the fact that you have made a way for us to know the Father, to love the Father, to enter into his presence once again, be such a joy in our lives, be such a victory in our lives, Lord God, that we would go out and be salt and light to the world this week. Thank you, Lord God, that we have the ability to rejoice in you. Thank you, Lord God, that you've given us the ability to worship and praise you in so many ways, that you've wired us each uniquely and differently, Lord God, to bring your praise and worship, Lord God. Thank you that you call us to write new songs, to sing new songs to you, to praise you with all of our being, Lord God. Thank you for the privilege it is to worship you because of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, Father God. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that even now, that as we, re we respond in song, would you lead us in that time? Would you cause our spirit, Lord God, to, to be joyful, to rise up, Lord God, and to sing these songs joyful, no matter what we're going through. I pray for those who are going through the most, Lord God, who are experiencing such suffering in this world. We pray for you to overcome those struggles, Lord God. And in the midst of that, Lord God, would you give, give us joy? as we wait on you to overcome those struggles and as we wait on you to come again, would you cause us to be a people who, whose joy is infectious, Lord God, who draw many to you, who cause others to say, why is it that you can be so joyful in the midst of, of these struggles? And to, to shine a light on who you are, Lord God. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We praise you, God the Father. Come and lead us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.